Well, I think that thus far the genius of this kind of underground that we're talking about is that it has no leadership. The Western world has labored for many, many centuries under a monarchical conception of the universe, that nature is run by a boss. And what we need to, to realize is that there can be, shall we say, a movement, a stirring among people, which can be organically designed instead of politically designed. It has no boss. Welcome to Being in the Way, the Alan Watts podcast, and I'm your host, Mark Watts. And today we're going to hear a very unique recording. It's from the summer of 1967. It was recorded on my father's houseboat, the ferryboat Vallejo in Sausalito. And it's a discussion that he had with Tim Leary, Allen Ginsberg, Alan Cohen of the Oracle, and Gary Snyder. And it's very interesting because they were talking about the Great Society, ideas for how to live with a culture that wasn't anchored to the military-industrial complex of the time. It has a lot of resonances for us today and some very interesting and practical advice. And it also shows my father in a different role than we usually hear him. Here he's the host and master of ceremonies and at times moderating a humorous conversation between these fellows. So it's Alan Watts, Alan Ginsberg, Tim Leary, Alan Cohen, and Gary Snyder in Changes, the Houseboat Summit, summer of 67, Ferryboat Vallejo, Sausalito, California. Enjoy the discussion. This is Alan Watts speaking. And I'm this evening on my ferryboat, the host to a fascinating party sponsored by the San Francisco Oracle, which is our new underground paper far outer than any far out that has yet been seen. And we have here Alan Cohen representing the paper, the Oracle. We have Alan Ginsberg, poet and rabbinic sadhu. We have uh, Timothy Leary. <laughs> about whom nothing needs to be said, and Gary Snyder, also poet, Zen monk, and old friend of many years. Uh, everybody is all bugged because they think, one, um, the dropout thing uh, really doesn't mean anything. It's what you're going to cultivate is a lot of freak out. Uh, hippies uh, goofing around and throwing bottles through windows uh, when they flip out on LSD. That's their stereotype vision. Obviously a stereotype. Sounds like bullshit. Second, no, no, it's, it's like, it's, uh, it's it's no different from the newspaper vision anyway. I mean, they've got the newspaper vision. And uh, secondly, they're afraid that there'll be some sort of fascist push, like is rumored lately, that everybody's going to be arrested. So that the lack of organization among, the or the lack of community, the lack of, uh, of communicating community among the hippies will lead to some uh, concentration camp situation or lead, as it has been in Los Angeles recently, to a dispersal of what yeah. what beginning it, of the community is, uh, began. I mean, these are the old <laughs> menopausal minds. Uh, uh, there was a psychiatrist named Adler in San Francisco whose interpretation of the mute being yeah. was that this is the uh, basis for new fascism yeah. uh, when a leader comes along. And I sensed in the activist movement the uh, the cry for a leader, uh, the cry yeah, for a Yeah, but they're just as intelligent as as, as uh, you are on this fact. They know about what happened in, in in Russia. That's the reason that they haven't got a big active organization is because they too are stumped by how do you have a community and a community movement uh, and cooperation within the community to make life more uh, pleasing for everybody, including the end of the Vietnam War. How do you have such a situation organized or disorganized as long as it's effective without a fascist leadership? Because they don't want to be that either. So they are conscious of the fact that they don't want to be messiahs, political messiahs. At least uh, uh, Savio is particular. He wants to go out yesterday. He was weeping, saying he wanted to go out and live in nature. <laughs> Beautiful. So, I mean, he's like um, basically where we are. So. Well, I think that thus far the genius of this kind of underground that we're talking about is that it has no leadership. Uh, the Western world has labored for many, many centuries 
under a monarchical conception of the universe, where God is the boss, and political systems and all kinds of law have been based on this model of the universe, that nature is run by a boss. Whereas the, if you take uh, the Chinese view of the world, which is organic, uh, they would say, for example, that the human body is an organization in which there is no boss. Uh, it is a situation of uh, order resulting from mutual interrelationship of all the parts. And what we need to, to realize is that there can be, shall we say, a movement, a stirring among people, which can be organically designed instead of politically designed. It has no boss. Yeah, well, they, they, and yet all the parts recognize each other in the same way as the cells of the body all cooperate together. Yeah. Well, it's a new social structure. Yes. It's exactly. a new social structure which follows certain kinds of uh, no, historically yeah, think, uh, known tribal models. Exactly, yeah. Uh, when you, my historical reading of the situation is that uh, these great monolithic groups that developed in history, oh. Rome, Turkey, uh, so forth, and they uh, always break down when enough people, and it's always the young, the creative, and the minority groups, drop out and go back to a tribal form. I, and I agree with uh, what I heard you say in the past, Gary, that the uh, basic unit is tribal. And what I envision is uh, thousands of small groups throughout the United States and Western Europe and eventually the world is dropping out. What happened when Rome fell? What happened when Jerusalem fell? Little groups well, went off precisely, together. what do you mean by drop out then? Vincent, yeah. you haven't dropped out. You're very, you dropped out of your job as a psychology teacher in Harvard. Now, what you've dropped into is, one, uh, a highly complicated series of arrangements for lecturing and for putting on the uh, festival. Well, I'm dropped out of that. <laughs> no, no, but you're not dropped out of the very highly complicated legal constitutional appeals, which you feel a sentimental regard for, as I do. You haven't, <laughs> you haven't um, dropped out of like a, a, a being the financial provider for Millbrook. And you haven't dropped out of planning and a conducting community organization and participating in it. And that community organization is related to the national community, too, either through the Supreme Court or through the very existence of the dollar that is exchanged for, for you to pay your lawyers or to take money to pay your lawyers in the theater. So you can't drop out, like, drop out, because you have it. Well, uh, let me explain. And so they it. think you mean, like, a drop out, like, a go live on the I hate, I hate Ashbury Street and do nothing at all. Even if you can do something like build car furniture and sell it or give it away and, and barter with somebody else. You have to gr drop out in a group. You drop out in oh. a small tribal group. Well, you drop it out one by one, but, you know, like you can join the subculture. Yeah. Maybe it's a, a drop out of what? <laughs> drop out Gary, of I think that you have something to say here because you, to me, are one of the most fantastically capable dropout people I've ever met. I, I think that at this point, you should say a word or two about your own experience of how to live on nothing, how to get by in life economically. And this is, this, this is the nitty-gritty. This is where it really comes down to in many people's minds. Where's the bread going to come from if everybody drops exactly. out? Now, you know expertly where it's going to come from, living a life of integrity and uh, not being involved in a commute, uh, <clears throat> necktie, strangle, uh, news scene. Well, this isn't news to anybody, but when, uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, when we dropped out, there wasn't a community. Uh, and there wasn't anybody who was going to take care of you at all. You were really completely on your own. What it meant was cutting down on your desires and cutting down on your needs to an absolute minimum. And it also meant, uh, don't be a bit fussy about how you work or what you do for a living. Uh, that meant uh, doing any kind of work, um, strawberry picking, carpenter laborer, longshore. Well, longshore is hard to get onto and it paid very well. And it, shipping out, that also pays very well. But at least in my time, it meant being willing to do any goddamn kind of labor that came your way and not being fussy about it. And, meant, and, it, and it meant cultivating the virtue of patience. Uh, the patience of sticking with a, s a shitty job uh, long enough to win the bread that you needed to have some more leisure, which meant more freedom to do more things that you wanted to do. 
uh, and, and mastering techniques of all kinds of techniques of living really cheap, like getting free rice off the docks because the loading trucks sometimes fork the dock, uh, fork the rice uh, sacks and, and spill little piles of uh, rice on the docks, which are usually thrown away. But I had it worked out with some of the guards down on the docks that they would gather 15, 25 pounds of rice for me and also tea. And uh, I'd pick it up once a week off the docks and then I'd take it around and give it to friends. And this was rice that was going to be thrown away otherwise. You know, there's little techniques like that. Uh, Second day vegetables in the supermarket. Yeah, we used to go around uh, at uh, one or two in the morning around the Safeways and the Piggly Wigglies in Berkeley with a shopping bag and hit the garbage cans out and back. And we'd get Chinese cabbage, cabbage, broccoli, lots of broccoli and uh, avocado, uh, artichokes that were thrown out because they didn't look sellable anymore. Uh, so I never bought I never bought any vegetables for the three years I was a graduate student at Berkeley. And when I made it meat, it was usually horse meat from the pet store because it, uh, they don't have a law that permits them to sell horse meat for human consumption in California like they do in Oregon. Does he make delicious horse meat sukiyaki? <laughs> well, I want to add to this, Gary, that during the time when you were living this way, I visited you on occasion, and, and you had a little hut way up on the hillside on um, Homestead Valley in Mill, in Mill Valley. And I want to say for the record <laughs> that this was one of the most beautiful pads I ever saw. It was sweet and clean, and uh, it had a very, very good smell to the whole thing. And you were living uh, what I consider to be a very noble life. Now, then the question that next arises, if this is the way of being a successful dropout, which I think it is, is true. Um, can you have a wife and child under such circumstances? Yeah, I think you can, sure. What about when the state forces you to send the child to school? You send it to school. Uh, oh, no, Congrats. come on. The, I, don't, I don't see this as a dropout at all. Uh, uh, that, no, I want, to say, I want to finish what I was going to say. That that's the way it was 10 years ago. Uh, today, there is a community, yeah. a huge community, which... When you drop out, when any kid drops out today, he's got a subculture to go fall into. He's got a place to go where there'll be friends and people that will put him up and people that will feed him at least for a while and keep feeding him indefinitely if he moves around from pad to pad. Uh, but, but that's just uh, stage one. The stage value, one. The value of the Lower East Side or of the district in uh, Seattle or the Haight-Ashbury is it provides a first uh, launching pad. Mm -hmm. But that that's, must be seen clearly as a way station. I don't think the Haight-Ashbury district is a place, any city for that matter, is a place where uh, the new tribal uh, I agree with you, is not, going to live. Not, not so that uh, I mean drop out, and I don't want to be misinterpreted. I'm dropping out step by step. Millbrook, by the way, is a tribal community. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the land. We're working out our way of um, import and export with the planet. We consider ourselves a tribe of mutants, just like all the little tribes of Indians were. I we happen to have our little uh, area there, and we we have to uh, <laughs> come to terms with the white men around us. So yes, there's no... Okay, we can't but now look, your dropout line is fine uh, for, the, for, the, for all those other people out there. You know, that's what you got to say to them. But I want to hear what you're building. What are you making? What are we building? Yeah, what are you building? I want to hear your views on that. Now, like, it's agreed we're dropping out, and yeah. there are techniques to do it. Now, what next? Where are we going now? What well, kind I'm of making, society are I'm we, making are we the prediction that thousands of groups will uh, just look around the uh, fake prop television set of American society and just open one of those doors. And when you open the doors, they don't lead to any room. They lead you out into the Garden of Eden, which is this planet. And then you find yourself a little <coughs> tribe wandering around. Uh... As soon as enough people do this, enough young people do this, uh, it will bring about an incredible change in the consciousness of this country and of the Western world. Well, that, that, that is happening, actually. Yeah. yeah. But, but that Garden of Eden is full of old rubber truck tires and tin cans right now, you know. Parts of it are. Uh, e each group that drops out has got to use uh, its two billion years of cellular equipment to answer those questions. Hey, how are we going to eat? Oh, there's no more paycheck. There's no more fellowship in the university. How are we going to eat? How are we going to keep warm? How are we going to defend ourselves? What is very important here is that, is that people learn the techniques uh, which have been forgotten, uh, that they learn new structures and new techniques. Like, you, you just can't go out and grow vegetables, man. You've got to know how to do it. You know, like we've got to learn to do a lot of things we've forgotten to do. I agree. That is very true, Gary. Our educational system in its entirety 
does nothing to give us any kind of material competence. In other words, exactly. we don't learn how to cook, how to make clothes, how to build houses, how to make love, or to do any of the absolutely fundamental things of life. The whole education that we get for our children in school is entirely in terms of abstractions. It trains you to be an insurance salesman or a bureaucrat or some kind of uh, um, cerebral character. Within Can the I next five years, probably, a, a modest beginning will be made in subculture uh, institutions of higher learning uh, that will informally begin to exist around the country and will provide this kind of education without being linked to the establishment, to big industry, to yeah. government. Well, oh, it's yeah. already happening. It's already happening. Really I think there will be a big yeah. extension of that, employing a lot of uh, potentially beautiful teachers who are unemployed at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, like there are gurus who are, are just waiting uh, to be put to use, and also drawing people who are working in the universities with a bad conscience off mm -hmm. uh, to join that. Exactly. See, uh, but there's a whole new order of technology that is required for this. A whole new science, actually, a whole new physical science is going to emerge for this. Because the boundaries of the old physical science are within the boundaries of the Judeo-Christian and Western imperialist boss sense of the universe that Alan is talking about. Uh, in other words, uh, our, our scientific tradition is uh, caught within the limits of that uh, father figure, Jehovah, uh, or Roman emperor model, uh, which limits our scientific objectivity. And, and, and actually holds us back from exploring areas of science which exactly. can be explored. Exactly. Exactly. So that really, you know, like our new technology yeah. goes with this. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the guy in Los Angeles who had a bad trip on LSD and turned himself into the police and wrote, please help me, signed, Jehovah. <laughs> God, that's funny. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> that's how he caught on, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here, though, is this thing, you see. Uh, we are talking about all this, which is really a rather small movement of people involved in the midst <laughs> of a fantastic multitude of people who can only continue to survive if automated industry feeds them, clothes, clothes them, houses them, and transports them by means of the creation of immense quantities of ersatz material, fake bread, fake homes, fake clothes, and fake, auto, fake autos. In other words, this thing is going on. You know, this huge, fantastic uh, numbers of people increasing, increasing, increasing. People think, you know, the population problem, something's going to happen in five years from now. Yeah. They don't realize it's right on us now. Mm. People are coming out of the walls. You got to start immediately putting the technology underground. I can think of different ways that we can do this symbolically. Uh, the solstice last April 21st, a group of us went out in front of the house in Millbrook, and uh, we took a sledgehammer, and we spent about an hour breaking through the uh, road. And we had this incredible piece of, of asphalt and uh, rock, about <laughs> four inches. And then we said, hey, underneath this planet somewhere, there's dirt. Yeah, and it was really magical. And once you get a little piece taken out, it took about an hour to get one little piece, then you just go underneath it and it begins to crumble. Uh, so that I think that uh, we should start a movement to uh, uh, one, one hour a day or one hour a week, take a little chisel and a little hammer and put a little hole in some of this uh, uh, plastic and uh, just see some um, earth come uh, up and put a seed there. I can foresee, and then put a little uh, ring of uh, mandalic, ring of uh, something around it. I can see the highways, and I can see the um, uh, subways, and I can see the patios and so forth. Uh, suddenly, the highway department come along and say, there's a rose growing in the middle of Highway 101. And then, then, the robot uh, power group will have to send a group of the highway department to kill the rose and put the asphalt down on the gentle, naked skin of the soil. Now, when they do that, we're getting to them. There'll be pictures in the paper, and uh, consciousness is going to change, because we've got to get to people's consciousness. We've got to let people realize what they're doing to the earth. And the theory of poetry you're dealing with there. <laughs> there we go. I'm the poet, and you're the politician. I've told you that for ten years. <laughs> I mean, I know someone now at stage who's studying psychology uh, and who doesn't know whether to drop out or not is pulled in two directions. I think there are many people like this. 
Yes, uh, I think he should drop out, and I want to be absolutely clear on that. And the papers, uh, nobody wants to listen to that simple uh, uh, two-syllable uh, uh, phrase. It gets jargled and jumbled, and uh, uh, and I mean it. Uh, there's... Now, everyone has to decide how he drops out and when, and he has to uh, uh, time it gracefully, but uh, that's the goal. Now, I can foresee that you might work for Susan Robux for six months to get enough money to go to India. But that's part of your dropout. Uh, and what I'm doing today, Alan, is part of my dropout. Uh, I do yeah, have responsibilities and yeah. contracts, yeah. and I don't think that anyone should violate contracts uh, with people that they love. But look uh, at a contract this. with a university. Huh, fine. Quit tomorrow. Uh, therefore, I have to detach myself slowly. When I was in India uh, two years ago... But, India, but you know, the university has personal relations also. I mean, that's, that's, they're not in contact with the university, they're in contact with persons. Yeah. Uh, they can't reject those persons necessarily. Well, you can... They have your bodhisattva mm -hmm. among those persons. You can, as, as, as Tim says, you can gracefully drop out at one time or another. Which I take to... No, I was uh, teaching at Berkeley last week. What do you mean, drop out? <laughs> you, you've got to do your yoga you as a college do professor. This. It's part you of the thing you're going to have to go through. And after you, after you do that, then you'll, yeah, but look, you'll shudder look, and run to the door. Surely the fact of the matter is that you can do this on a small scale, as an individual, where just a few people are doing this, as they always have done. There have always been a kind of elite minority who dropped out who were the sages in the mountains. We're talking a drama uh, now. You're not talking about, you know, anthropological realities. The anthropological reality is the human beings, in their nature, want to be in touch with what's real in themselves and in the universe. And that, uh, for example, the longshoremen with their automation contract in San Francisco, a certain number of them have been laid off for the rest of their lives with full pay. And some of them have been laid off already for five years with full pay by their contract. Now, my brother-in-law's a longshoreman. He's been telling me about what's happened to these guys. Most of them are pretty illiterate. A large proportion of them are Negroes. The first thing they all did was get boats and drive around San Francisco Bay because they have all this leisure. Uh, then a lot of them got tired of driving around boats that were just like cars, and they started sailing. Then a few of them started making their own sailboats. They move into and respond to the possibility of challenge. Things become simpler and more complex and more challenging for them. The same is true of hunting. Some guy says, I'm going to go hunting and fishing all the time when I have my leisure, by God. And so he goes hunting all the time. Then he says, I want to do this in a more interesting way. So he takes up bow hunting. Yeah. And then the next step is, and this has happened, he says, I'm going to try making my own arrowheads. And he learns how to fl flake his own arrowheads out. Now, human beings want reality. That's, I think, part of human nature. And uh, television and drinking beer and watching television is what the working man laid off does for the first two weeks. But then in the third week, he begins to get bored. And in the fourth week, he wants to do something with his body and with his mind and with his senses. I think that automation in the affluent society, uh, plus psychedelics, plus a, for some curious reason, uh, a whole catalytic a spiritual change or bend of mind that seems to be taking place in the West today, especially, is going to result, uh, can result ultimately, in a vast leisure society in which people uh, uh, will voluntarily reduce their number. And because human beings want to do that which is real, simplify their lives. Like uh, the whole problem of consumption and, and marketing is radically altered if a number of people, a large number of people, voluntarily choose to consume less. And people will voluntarily choose to consume less if their interests are turned in another direction. If what is exciting to them is no longer things but states of mind. That's true. Now, what yes. is happening now is that people are becoming interested in states of mind. And things are really substitutes for states of mind. Uh, so what I visualize is uh, a very complex and sophisticated cybernetic technology uh, surrounded by thick hedges of trees somewhere, say, around Chicago. And the rest of the nation, a buffalo pasture. That's very close uh, to what I think. With a large number of people going around making their own arrowheads because it's fun, but they know right. better. Yeah, they know they don't have to make it. No, this is interesting. Our, uh, our utopian visions are coming closer together. I say that the industry should be underground. You say it should be in Chicago. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, this is but that's the same idea. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, like those right. who want to be technological engineers will be respected and allowed right. to do that. Yeah. And the other thing is, like, you can go out and live close to nature, or you can go back and... But you won't be allowed to time. drive a car outside this uh, technological... Uh, well, you won't want to. Right. You know, like, that's no the road. difference, baby. Be, you know, no it's not that you won't be allowed to, it's that you won't want you to. Won't that's want where it's to. got to be at. Because it's the same thing when we get down to, say, some fundamental questions of food. Um, 
More and more, one realizes that the mass-produced food is not worth eating. And therefore, in order to delight in things to eat, you go back to the most primitive processes of uh, raising and preparing food, because that has taste in it. And uh, I see that uh, there will be a sort of flip, that as all the possibilities of technology and automation make it possible for everybody to be assured of having the basic necessities of life, they will then say, oh, yes, we have all that. Now, let's uh, we, we can always rely on that. But now, in the meantime, while we don't have to work, let's go back to making arrowheads and to um, raising the most amazing plants. Yeah. And uh, what would be so funny <laughs> would be is that they would all get so good at it that the technology right. center at Chicago would rust away. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. And forget, right. And just, <laughs> forget they needed uh, it even. That, that's yeah. exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> <coughs> the uh, psychedelic dropouts are going to be having so much fun there will be so much obvious but, Tim, healthier. Do you see any indication among people who are oppressed and really turned on uh, that they are cultivating this kind of material competence? Now, I, I, I haven't seen too much of it yet. I went to... Uh, some of those kids at Big Sur have got it. Yeah, maybe you're right. They're, they're, they learn, they're learning. Like a few years ago, they used to go down to Big Sur and they didn't know how to camp or how to dig the trees. Uh, but, uh, you know, like what Martine has been telling me and what I've seen down there lately is that they, they're getting very sharp about what together that's edible, how to get uh, sea salt, uh, what, what are the edible plants and the edible seed. And the revolutionary technological book for this right, state no, is A.L. Kroeber's Handbook of the California Indians, which tells you what's good to eat. <laughs> oh, and how well, to prepare that's it. what I wanted you to bring out. <laughs> but the thing is this, look, so many people I know... And also what to use for tan packs, uh, milkweed fluff. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And diapers made of shredded cedar bark. Yeah. Oh, the whole thing is all there. <laughs> A.L. Kroba. Handbook of the California Indians. <laughs> Beautiful. But the thing that is this, I found so many people who, you know, are, are of the turned on type. And the circumstances and surroundings under which they live are just plain cruddy. You would think that people who had seen what you can see with the visions uh, of psychedelics would reflect themselves in forms of life and art that would be like Persian miniatures because obviously Persian miniatures, Moorish arabesques are all reflecting the state of mind that people have turned on. And they are rich and glorious beyond belief. Majestic. Majestic, <laughs> yeah. Well, now, why doesn't it so occur? It is slowly beginning to happen because I've noticed that, since, that recently... All turned on people are becoming more colorful. Mm. They're wearing beads and gorgeous clothes and so on and so forth. And it's gradually coming out because you remember the old beatnik days when everybody was in blue jeans and ponytails and no lipstick and uh, drab and crummy. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, something is beginning to happen. There is it wasn't quite that bad, but we were mostly concerned with not being consumers then. Yes, I know. Now I see it beginning to happen. Uh, Timothy here, instead of wearing his old uh, whatever it was that he used to wear, has now got a white uh, tunic on with uh, gold and colorful uh, gimp, gimp on it. Gimp? gimp. Yes. And uh, it, it's very beautiful. And he's wearing a necklace and uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, c color is at last coming into the scene. Well, okay, well, let's well, get back, back let's before get the roundheads and before Cromwell. I yes, it is. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. get practical here. Uh, I think we're all concerned about the uh, increasing number of people who are dropping out and uh, wondering where to go from there. Uh -huh. Now, let's come up with some practical uh, suggestions which uh, we might uh, hope could unfold in the next few months. And okay, year. There's, there's three categories, wilderness, rural, and urban. Yeah. Like there's going to be bush people, farm people, and city people. Bush tribes, farm tribes, and city tribes. <coughs> Beautiful. I, that makes immediate sense to myself. Let me throw in How about beach here. people? Uh, the word is evil and technology. Somehow they come together. And where there's an increase in technology and technological facility, there's an increase in what we usually call human evil. I wouldn't agree with that, no. No, I, there's all kinds of non-evil technologies. I'd like to ask for clarification if there's something... No, like, like flint, uh, 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 Neolithic uh, obsidian flaking is technology. Uh, 
I but not at that stage. It produces uh, evil. Yes, but you, but what you mean, I think, is this: that when you go back to the great myths about the origin of evil, actually the Hebrew words which say good and evil as the the knowledge of good and evil being the result of eating the fruit of the, of the tree of knowledge. These words mean advantageous and disadvantageous, and they're words connected with technical skills. And the whole idea is this, which you find reflected in the, uh, the Taoist philosophy, mm. that the moment you start interfering in the course of nature with a mind that is centered and one-pointed and analyzes everything and breaks it down into bits. The moment you do that, you lose contact with your original know-how by means of which you now color your eyes and breathe and beat your heart. And for thousands of years, mankind has lost touch with his original intelligence. And he has been absolutely fascinated by this the kind of political godlike controlling intelligence where they go but 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 and analyze things all over the place and he has forgotten to trust his his, his own organism now the whole thing that uh, that everything uh, is is coming to be realized today not only through people who take psychedelics but also through many scientists they're realizing that this linear kind of intelligence cannot keep up with the course of nature it can only solve trivial problems when the big problems happen too fast to be thought about in that way. And so those of us who uh, are in some way or other through psychedelics, through meditation, through what have you, are getting back to being able to trust our original intelligence, are suggesting an entirely new course for the development of civilization. Well, it happens that civilization develops uh, with the emergence of um, specialization in labor. Yes. And the emergence of a class structure. A class structure uh, can't survive or can't put across its principle and expect people to accept it uh, if they believe in themselves. Uh, if they believe individually, one by one, that they are... Uh, in some way godlike or buddha-like or potentially illuminati uh, so that it's almost ingrained in civilization and freud said this you know uh, civilization as a neurosis that uh, that the part of the nature of civilization is that it must put down the potential uh, of every individual development uh, and this is the difference between uh, the, that kind of society which we call civilized and that much more ancient kind of society which is still viable and still survives which we call primitive in which everybody is potentially a chief and which everybody, like among the Comanche or the Sioux, everybody in the whole culture was expected to go out and have a vision at one time in his life. To, in other words, to leave the society, to have some transcendental experience, to have a song and a totem come to him, which he need tell no one ever, and then come back and live with this double knowledge in society. Uh, in other words, through him having had his own isolation, his own loneliness, and his own vision. He knows that the game rules of society right. are fundamentally an illusion. And then the society, you know, the society not only permits that, the society is built on Is that. built on that, right. But in other words, has a society nature which has been out of it. That society is strong and viable, which recognizes its own provisionality. And no one who ever came in contact with the Plains Indians didn't think they were men. <clears throat> Didn't they quit? Right. They were men. They were men. Yeah. Every record of American Indians, uh, uh, from the cavalry, the pioneers, the missionaries, the Spaniards, says every one of these people was men. Uh, uh, in fact, I was reading something just the other day talking about the Yurok Indians, uh, an early settler up there, no, an early explorer up there, comment on their fantastic self confidence. He said, Every Indian has this fantastic self confidence. And they laugh at me, he said. They laugh at me and they say, Aren't you sorry you're not an Indian? Poor wretched Indians. <laughs> <laughs> this fellow said. Well, that, that, that is because every one of them has gone out and had this vision experience, has, has been completely alone with himself and face to face with himself, and has contacted powers outside of but anything that society could give him. And society expects him to contact powers outside of society in those cultures. Yes, every healthy culture does. Every healthy culture provides for their being non joiners, sannyasi, hermits, 
This, this is the next step. This is every next, so, every this healthy is society has to tolerate this. See, a, a society like the Comanche or the Sioux demands that everybody go out there and have this vision and, and incorporates it and ritualizes it within the yes. culture. Then a society like India, uh, a, a step more civilized, uh, permits some individuals to have these visions, but doesn't demand it of everyone. We have to wonder why some people are ready to drop out than others. It may be explained by theory of reincarnation. The people that don't want to drop out and can't conceive of living on this planet outside of the prop television studio are just unlucky enough to have been born into this uh, sort of thing, maybe the first or second time. They're still entranced by, the, uh, by all of the handmade, man-made, the man-made props. Uh, but there's no question that uh, we should... Uh, uh, I think we should uh, consider but how more and more people who are ready to drop out If there is a value out. in being a dropout, that is to say being an outsider, you can only appreciate and realize this value if there are, in contrast with you, insiders and squares. The two are mutually supportive. Yeah, if someone says to me, I just can't conceive of uh, dropping out, I can say, well... Um, uh, you're having fun with this, uh, this go-round in? Fine. Uh, I'm sure yes. We've all done that many times in the past. But, but the two groups, uh, the insiders uh, and the outsiders. I still think it's too vague because it doesn't say drop out of what precisely. And what, we're dealing, what everybody's dealing with is people. It's not dealing with institutions also, dealing with them, but also dealing with people, working with them, including the police. You like, like you have to be able, to, if you're going to talk this way, you have to be able to say specifically say to someone in Wichita, Kansas, who says, uh, I'm going to drop out. Yeah. What do you advise? Uh, how do right. you advise me to stay living around here? Let's in be practical. Like. Let, let's okay. be less historical now for a while. Let's be very practical about ways in which uh, people who want to uh, find the tribal way... Well, this is what I've been telling to kids all over Michigan and Kansas. For example, I've, been, I've, I've had them? this question. I tell them, first of all, uh, say, do you want to live here or do you want to go someplace else? Good. All right, they say, I want to stay around where I am. I say, okay. Get in touch with the Indian culture here. Find out what was here before. Find out what the mythologies were. Find out what the local deities were. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get all of this out of books. Go and look at your local archaeological sites. Beautiful. Pay a reverent visit to the local American Indian tombs and also the tombs of the early settlers. Find out what your original ecology was. Is it short grass prairie? Is it long grass prairie here? Uh, Beautiful. Uh, go out and live on the land for a while. Set up a tent and camp out and watch the clouds and watch the water and watch the land and uh, get a sense of what the climate is here. Because since you've been living in a house all your life, you probably don't know what the climate is. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, then decide how you want to make your living here. Uh, do you want to be a farmer or do you want to be a hunter and food gatherer? <laughs> you know, like it's, you start from the ground up. And you can do it in any part of this country today, cities and all. You, you but for this continent, I take it back to the Indians. Yeah, the I area. agree with you completely. Find out what the Indians were up to in your own area. Whether it's uh, Utah or, or, or Kansas or New Jersey. That is a stroke uh, of cellular revelation and genius, uh, Gary. That's one of the wisest things I've heard anyone say in years. That's exactly how it should be done. Uh, I do see the need for transitions, though. And you say that there will be city people as well as um, country people and mountain people. Uh, I would suggest that for the next year or two or three, which are going to be uh, nervous, transitional, mutational years, where things are going to happen very fast, by the way, that uh, the uh, transition could be facilitated if every city set up uh, little meditation rooms and little shrine rooms where uh, the uh, people in transition dropping out can meet uh, and meditate together. It is already happening at the psychedelic shop. It's happening in New York. I see no reason, though, why there shouldn't be 10 or 15 or 20 such places in San Francisco. There are already are. Uh, yeah, I know. But let's encourage that. And, yeah. uh, I, was, I was just in Seattle, and I was urging the people there. Hundreds of them crowd into um, coffee shops, and there's this beautiful energy. They, they are liberated people, uh, these kids, but they don't know where to go. And they just need, uh, uh, they don't need leadership, but they need, I think, a, 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 a variety of suggestions uh, from people who have thought about this, giving them the options to move in any Well, way. I'd like to see the, the different. Just a minute. Yeah. Right? The different uh, meditation rooms can have different styles. One can be Zen, one can be macrobiotic, one can be uh, bhakti chanting, one can be uh, rock and roll psychedelic, one can be lights. Uh, if we learn anything from ourselves, we learn that uh, God delights in variety. 
Uh, they've got to meet each other and fi- form these tribal, uh, I would say, reincarnation groups because uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, people who are ready to drop out and turn on will, will come to these centers and they'll wander around and they'll form natural cellular groups and they will leave the city. I would suggest a step, practical step number two, that the human being uh, in San Francisco be a model. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've all tried different models of uh, summer schools and institutes and research projects and uh, individual dropouts uh, and psychedelic celebrations and so forth and the Avalon and Fillmore and so forth. I would say that the uh, human being was was a tremendously important uh, thing in the consciousness of San Francisco. Now, if that thing could happen in uh, every large city in the country. And again, the beautiful thing about the being was it had no leadership. Uh, it had no big financing. It, it would just grow automatically. Yeah, but we're it, accused of being the leader. We're not. You know, we're, what were we doing up on that platform? That's a charge that doesn't bother me at all. There were 50 people up on that platform, and every one of them was a leader. So were the people in the audience. The reason was that nobody came out and said, we are the leaders. And no, no, but it said Because that's no, bullshit. Nobody claims to be leader, but I remember sitting up there. They can say, every time they say, every time they say you're a leader, you point the Snyder. Well, now look here. Yeah. You see? But but the, I do that but, anyway. But the press, yeah, I know. But, the, but, but the press has a leadership complex. Yeah. That's, they, that's they, how you yeah they keep calling Gary my disciples. Oh, they want to find ringleaders. <laughs> Can I have you blowing his conch horn? <laughs> one of the four philosophical questions is who started it? And whenever the police or the press barge into a situation, they want to know who started it. Right. In other words, because they're still thinking about God and the right, first exactly. cause, and they who's want to charge? know who started, yeah. who's in charge, and yeah. so on. <laughs> who gets but the you know, who gets the right? Let, let's get back to a fundamental thing. I think that what you are really, all of you, are having the courage to say is that the absolutely primary thing is that there be a change of consciousness in the individual, that uh, he <clears throat> escape from the hallucination that he is a separate ego in an alien universe, and that we all come to realize primarily that each one of us is the whole works. That we, each one of us is what is real and has been real for always and always and always and will ever be. And uh, j- although the time language may not be appropriate here, but nevertheless, we are that. And to the extent that it can be spread around, that that's what you and I are. And we lose our anxieties and we lose our terror of death and our terror of unimportance and all that kind of thing. That this is the absolutely essential ingredient, which if we get hold of that point, all the rest will be added unto you, you know, in the sense of seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Right. Isn't that what you're saying? I mean, isn't that absolutely basic? that even if this is only realized in a a statistical minority, nevertheless, it's immensely powerful. It affects consciousness. It affects everybody. I would add to practical step number two that more celebrations be set up over the, or more beings. uh, The the practical, it just occurred to me, the practical details, the model of it is something like the Mahalila. Uh, Like you're asking, how is it going to work? Well, now, the Mahalila is uh, is a group of about uh, three different families uh, who have sort of pooled their resources, none of which are very great. Uh, but they have decided to play together and to work together and to take care of each other. And that means, like like all of them are doing ways, uh, have re- ways of getting a small amount of bread which they share. And uh, other people contribute a little money when it comes in. And then they work together on creative projects, like they're working together on a light show right now for a poetry reading that we're going to give. And they consider themselves a kind of extended family or clan. And like when they went to the Bee and they had a banner which said Mahalila, like that yeah. was their clan banner. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and, the model. That's the, and that's absolutely the, model. the model. And the model for the time is that, <laughs> is that breaking out of the, of, the, of the smaller family organization, we work in slightly larger structures, like clan structures, in which people do work at various jobs and bring in whatever bread they can from various jobs, but they're willing to pool it and share it, and they learn how to work and play together. And then they re- then they relate that to a larger sense of the tribe, which is also loose. But for the time being, everybody has to be able from time to time to do some little job. Uh, but 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 the reference is uh, the the thing that makes it different is that you don't bring it home to a very tight individual or or one monogamous family unit, but you bring it home to a slightly larger unit where the sharing is greater. 
I think that's where it starts. No, I think that's very important. The extended yeah. family is the key. The extended family, I think, is where it starts. And my own particular hobby horse on this is that the extended family leads to matrilineal descent. And when we get matrilineal descent, then we'll have group marriage. And when we have group marriage, we'll have the economy licked. Because with the group marriage, uh, capitalism is doomed. And civilization goes out. <laughs> <laughs> Practical step number three, <laughs> which I would like to see. Come on, Tim. Is you're really up to the occasion. Practical step number three. I think we should encourage uh, extended families everywhere. Yeah. Well, it's very practical to encourage extended families because the present model of the family is a hopeless breakdown. Because, first of all, the family is an agrarian culture institution, right. which is not suited to an urban culture, because all the family consists in is a dormitory, where a wife and children are located, and a husband who engages in a mysterious activity in an office or a factory in which neither the wife nor the children have any part nor interest, mm. save that he bring home an secretaries. abstraction called money, and where there are lots of pretty secretaries yeah. in the scene in which he actually works, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so uh, they, they have no relation whatsoever to what he does. And furthermore, the awful thing about the, the family as it exists at the moment is that the husband and the wife both feel guilty about not bringing up their children properly. And therefore, they live for their children instead of living out their own lives and doing their own interesting work, in which the children would automatically become interested as participants and watchers on the side. As it is, they're doing everything. They say, We're, we live, we work, we earn our money for you, darlings. And these poor darlings feel all this thing thrown at them and they don't want to do with it. Mm. And then they are sent away to school, shrilled after school, as Dylan Thomas put it, and to be educated for everything and nothing. By strangers. By strangers. Mm. Who are dubious. Who will uh, teach them all sorts of purely... Moral, spiritual, intellectual, and sexual characteristics. Right. <laughs> Abstract uh, formulations and things they'll learn. And uh, the, the, the family has no reality. And the, the greatest institution today in the American family is the babysitter. Someone to just take the children out of our consciousness while we enjoy ourselves. And the death sitter to take the old people out of the And the death place. sitter, exactly. And even death has been taken from the people. Yes. Everything has. The, the mort courtesy of the mortician. Mm -hmm. Yes. A good death. A good death is mm -hmm. no longer possible, practically. So, well, practice you know, that I, I have a four-stage thing. American Indian technologies, practical now, meditation centers, group marriage, and periodical gatherings of the tribes. Mm. I don't agree with group marriage. Uh, we, are, right, group we, are, we are tribal. We are a tribal of uh, people. Uh, you cannot have infidelity in a tribe. Infidelity, uh, infidelity sexual freedom, infidelity is, is defined anonymous as outside the personal ant hill sexuality. Every no, woman. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is, every, let me finish. Every woman is all woman. If you can't find all women in one woman, it's your problem. I do think it's possible for some of us to have found all women in one woman. I want. I want to get back at. I mean, like, let me, just let, let me just get this. something with him. Uh, infidelity means uh, denying your commitments. Now, if your commitments are within a group marriage, then fidelity is being true within your group marriage. And infidelity is, is being untrue or dishonest outside of that. Now, there's, there are some cultures in South America in which all forms of marriage are permitted. There are group marriages, polyandrous marriages, polygamous marriages, and monogamous marriages. By group marriages, just a moment, let's get a question of definition here. Okay, group marriage is where a number of people as a group, whatever the number is, uh, announce uh, a marriage is a social announcement of commitment. Yeah. Uh, announce that we will be responsible for the children we produce and for each other. So, in other words, all males and all females in this group can be in mutual intercourse with each other. Yeah. But not outside the group. But not outside, outside the group. Outside the group. But you course. make rules to take care of that. You got to bring I'm in. I'm not making rules. I'm just, I'm just telling okay. you what the anthropological precedences are. Yes. These things. Yes. 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 Uh, it happens that in this South American culture that that the majority of the marriages are monogamous. 
But it also happens that there are some polyandrous, some polygamous, and a few group ones. And, and I think that, uh, that what we can allow is people to combine in whatever combinations they wish. Oh, I certainly would agree with that. When people, just as Lao Tzu said, when the great Tao lost, there came talk of duty to man and right conduct. And so when the essential idea of love is lost, there comes talk of fidelity. That actually... The only possible basis for a two beings, male and female, to relate to each other is to grant each other total freedom and say, I don't put any bonds on you, you don't put any bonds on me because I want you, I love you the way you are. And I want you to be that. The minute you start making contracts and bonds and signing on the dotted line, you are wrecking the whole relationship. And you just have to trust to the fact that human beings should be legally allowed to trust each other and to enter into a fellowship that does not involve a contractual arrangement. I think we all agree with that. You know, because if you don't well, do that, you'll yeah, kill it. In primitive cultures, marriage is not a, a contractual uh, a, a, a arrangement. But what it is, is it's a public announcement. Yes. What it amounts to. It's, it's a relationship which is made public. What was your fourth point, Gary? Occasional gatherings of the tribe. Tribes. That wasn't a point. It was an activity. Well, I, I, uh, it seems to me then... So you say rather than group marriage, extended families. <laughs> uh, extended cooperation structures, in other words. American Indian technologies, meditation centers, extended cooperative clan type or extended family type structures with much more permissiveness in the nature of the family structure than is permitted, say, in Judeo-Christian tradition, and uh, gatherings of the larger tribes periodically. <coughs> well, practical suggestion number six. I suggest that we have uh, meetings in cities uh, April 21st. I suggest we have, uh, say, national meetings, uh, or one, one national meeting perhaps uh, June 21st, and that we start moving through Europe to the east so that we would, in September 21st, um, be uh, on the door between India and China with uh, as many Indians or Westerners or people that we picked up on the way. Uh, I think that's the quickest way to end racial prejudice and the war in Vietnam. Some cultures aren't going to understand this. Yet. And They're I don't think you have more than 20,000 people. And that, was, and that was done anyway, mm. all, the way, all the way around there. And that was done anyway by uh, Shankar Abdeo, and he got stopped at the border of Burma. But, but, but you know, uh, let him through, but they wouldn't, the Chinese wouldn't let him through, and the Indians were upset. There's, there's a social and historical problem here. One is that California is the only place that's ready for this problem. Right. San Francisco is uh, the place. Yeah. Uh, like you couldn't, you couldn't do this in Japan. Well, it's already done that. Now let's move Not it yet. out. No, but it you can't do it yet. yet. It hasn't done it yet. A great, a great percentage of the world is going to have to move through the drama of Western culture and technology in some accelerated way before they're ready for this. Like, like America is the only culture that's uh, in which a, a number of people have seen through it and are able to go beyond it. Japan isn't ready to, for example. It would, it would, uh, it would be uh, incredibly eccentric to them. Nobody's ready to try that. I, I question that. I think that uh, if you look at the spread of American ideology, uh, France is just now starting its super drugstores. Uh, yeah. uh, you must, must not... Uh, uh, fail to realize the authentic, uh, deep American uh, spirit behind this. And I think that uh, uh, if uh, it's taken 15 years for France to accept the uh, um, super drugstore, uh, why not six months to accept uh, the being in San Francisco? Well, because, because uh, as any the way they the spread world. drugs or Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola was they, uh, when Coca-Cola first showed up, in uh, the Grand Canal in Venice, or Coca-Cola first showed up in Pakistan, it was considered eccentric. But uh, if, if Pepsi-Cola can do it, the energy and the cellular collectivity which started here can move much more quickly because it's talking to deeper things in uh, the human being than Pepsi-Cola. I think but these, these things people, should these start people moving. Are, are, uh, so many of these people in Africa and Asia are caught up in the drama of uh, progress. They want nothing more than to come to America and get a large apartment, <laughs> a large apartment and a large car and a big home. This, really, this is part they, of the paradox. They have it, they we can, they we can tell them. Uh, I feel the same way about uh, the problem with uh, the, the American Negro. Uh, does he have to become a middle-class white 
before he can then go on and leave that? Uh, I don't think we have to uh, uh, go through these uh, uh, historical periods. I think it's possible to move it faster. Well, I hope it's and possible to, to accelerate it. And but if we, uh, but it, you can't take it we, around the world this year or next year. Yeah. Like the drama is changing. Yeah. Like what people are interested in is not things at states of mind. You know, like that's the cultural shift. Is taking no, this is now. a very important yeah. state of this. Really? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've we've turned a corner. It's a bigger corner than the Reformation, probably. Yes. Ah. It's a corner of the, uh, on the order of the change between Paleolithic and Neolithic. Hmm. Uh, and, and it's a it's like one of the three or four major turns in the history of man, not just culture, but man. <coughs> Right. Now, an enormous number of people go into the heart of New York every day for no other reason than to shop. Uh, there are, to a large extent, frustrated women living in these wretched dormitories. And their husbands are working, and the women go in in order to get some kind of sense of existence, of being, by buying things. Now, supposing it happens that instead of that, they change their state of mind. Right. Instead of buy, going out, you know, and, and buying something. They change their state of mind sitting where they are in the first place. Then Bonwit Teller, uh, everything in the middle of town simply collapses. Lord and Taylor, and so on. There's no more reason for existence. It's like Market Street in San Francisco, where everything is slowly falling apart because it's so ridiculous to park there and you can't get at the place anyhow. So where are people going to buy their Ewer ticket machines and their numbers? Suppose they don't want them. Pardon me? Suppose they don't want them. Well, we all have them. We'll buy them from Japan. Yeah, we're transitional <laughs> figures. Well, <laughs> it's decentralized. Yeah. No, like, we don't need them. Like, I would be happy to hear Larry Bird sing his, his, his corn yeah. dance and his buffalo dance, and I don't want to take that, you know. I'll hear it, and that's in my mind for the rest of my life. All right. Well, you're, I mean, the problem here is that, like, there's a withering away of the state. Yeah. But it's called advanced let, electronics. It's called let the state disintegrate. Well, the part, part yeah, but the, advanced, and an advanced technology such as we're talking about, unless you can magically transform it into some Buck Mr. Fuller body, <coughs> you know, each individual tribe can operate and create whatever it needs. Other than that, there's the technology as we know it now. And well, I think that the technology... Like a, like a large electronic network. I think that the technology withers away as people learn to do it themselves. Like, it's more interesting to do it yourself yeah. at home with your friends. Like, sit around and blow the buffalo horn and blow the conch horn and then turn on the television. Was, one, and then turn on the television. And not turn on the television. That, but that was like conditions that were possible for when the continent held 50 million Indians. Yeah. But, but now uh, the continent holds a great many more. But and well, that's still what's most interesting. But to do what you can do yourself. The whole problem is reproduction. It's not only the reproduction of the species in a sec second place, <coughs> well, but, but reproduction as we are now reproducing what we are saying on tape. Because if supposing this conversation were very turned on and far out, I don't know whether it is or not, people would say, oh, what a pity that didn't get recorded. Somebody See, because it, it didn't really happen unless it was recorded. And increasingly, we're developing all kinds of systems for verifying reality by echoing it. Well, trained minds remember. And the words of the Buddha were all remembered. Yeah, by oral, tradition, talking, oral tradition. And the words of the Buddha came down for 200 years before anybody put it in writing. Because oral people tradition. were paying attention to what he said. And only then did they start embellishing it. Yeah. But Krishnamurti would argue that remembering it was already a fallacy. Well, he's very pure. <laughs> Tim Allen said he was a bridge builder, that he wanted to be a bridge builder. Now, that stalled car, if, uh, we've all got to be bridge builders in one sense, I think, perhaps. Um, he was stalled in hate Asbury amongst the acid heads, and no one gave him a push. Uh, if we're telling the kids they're doing something holy, they have to, to a certain extent, we have to be a little bit holy. We, and holiness is given. And we have to, we have to learn to give. Um, the, um, the, the diggers uh, have, have said that since the being on January the 14th, thousands and thousands of kids who don't really know where they're at, but are attracted because they want to know where they're at, have come to the city. But they come to the city and they don't quite know whether to be defiant, they don't know. Uh, they, they don't know what to be, and unless they can become bridges for themselves, each person a bridge for themselves, so they can show that what they have got is something giving. Um, the message doesn't get across. 
The car should be pushed. Exactly. It's not enough to tell them that what they're doing is what they're doing by dropping out is right. <clears throat> yeah, that's the point I'm trying to get at. Yes, yeah. well, that's very important. It's the, the point We've got to become saints. Well, we at least which, have which to Which is not even a silly thing to say. Right. It's not. Exactly. It's exactly it. They've got to be told that they're pursuing the holiest uh, road But they have to understand what that means. Well, there should be, uh, again, if we have these meditation centers in all cities, there would be centers where the Gita would be read, where the uh, ancient sutras would be read, where uh, they would be reminded. Uh, this is not, this is well, not teaching. Yeah, what we need is personal example all over the place. Right, really. but, but uh, I, I would uh, suggest that in these meditation centers there be uh, some program of readings, not in the sense of educating or teaching facts, but just reminding uh, young people people and any person who drops out and turns on that they are uh, part of an ancient uh, profession, the only holy profession, the profession that's kept the flame going, and uh, it certainly should uh, express itself in pushing that Mercedes. Right. You need well, it's practical this is, to well, to get, uh, do you think it's practical to try to get some sort of meditation in the public schools? No. Drop out of the public schools. The public schools... <laughs> Are, cannot be compromised with. No. No. Why say you shouldn't compromise with the public schools if you can compromise with technology? I've heard. We're not compromising with IBM or with General Electric. We're simply saying, as Gary has said, that uh, part of man's karmic heritage is the ability to uh, do incredible things with his hands and his... Uh, uh, analytic mind, but they should be holy things. Yeah, it's, it's a question of right occupation and yes. right conduct. It's, it's, it's not like that technology is bad or that schools are bad. Well, now look here. What are we saying when we say now something is holy? That means you should take a different attitude to what you're doing than if you were, for example, doing it for kicks. Now, there's a, a curious thing here. I have noticed with Allen Ginsberg that when he chants Hindu sutras, he doesn't do it in a pious way. Right. There's a joyousness and yes. there's a feeling of delight to, do, to doing this chant that has we more zip to it than anything jumping. we knew in the past was being holy. <laughs> now, when he was doing something holy in the past, that you had to put on a solemn expression of saying, we are doing this, but it hurts, but it's good for us. He's not doing that when he chants that. He's not saying it hurts and therefore it's good for me. He's saying it's good for me because I enjoy it. It's gorgeous. I'm going right in there and I'm going to say all these Om Hari Ram Krishna Rama Hari Ram Hari etc. You see? He's turning himself on. And I told his love and love his right. And I, I told some nuns a little while ago where the Mother Superior came and they were all talking about the reform of the liturgy and how the Catholic Church has gotten itself in a mess by translating the Latin liturgy into terrible English and all the magic has gone out of it. And I said, you should come and listen to Allen Ginsberg chant the sutras because then you'd know how to celebrate Mass properly. So, when we're talking about something being holy, we've got to be very careful. Yes. We're saying now, Gary, you were saying, all right, people have got to be saints. And you said, well, that's not, uh, just, a, not just a joke to say this. Mm. But it's got to be saints in an entirely new sense, not this masochistic kind of sainthood, whereby uh, I am holy because I hurt. Yeah. And the m amount of personal hurt that I've piled up is the... Uh, measure of my holiness. Well, that's the Judeo-Christian day the, which says that the cross is at the center of the universe. But no, what, about, <laughs> but what about India where we do have a, like a giant psychedelic community and many tribal groups and tribal gatherings which serve as the model for our own? <coughs> what kind of material system is that? Uh, and would that be acceptable to Mario and Sami? Uh, sure, it's, it's acceptable. <laughs> so what do you think of Swami Bhakti Vedanta's plea for the acceptance of Krishna in every direction. Why, it's a lovely, positive thing to say Krishna. Yeah. You know, like Krishna, is a, it's, it's a beautiful mythology, and it's a beautiful yeah. practice. It should be encouraged. Yeah. He think about it, he feels it's the one uniting thing. Uh, he feels a monopolistic, well, the one thing, thing about that. We well, I tell you, I think why he feels this is that it is... The, the mantrams, the images of Krishna have no... have, in this culture, no foul associations. Yeah. The word God is contaminated. So Tillich would say the ground of being instead of God. Anything except saying yeah. God. The word 
uh, get down on your knees and be humble before your heavenly father. That gives everybody the the, gift, the, the creeps. It just, it's just awful to say something like that, you see. Because all these Christian images have horrible associations attached to them. Whereas when somebody comes in from the Orient with a new religion, which hasn't got any of these associations in our minds, all the words are new, all the rites are new, and yet somehow it has feeling in it. And we can get with that, you see, and we can dig that. And it can do something for us that it can't do in Japan. For example, in Japan, when young people hear the Buddhist sutra chanted, they think, oh, yeah. don't let's hear that thing, because that, they, they associate all that with fogeyism. Here in, in the Buddhist churches, in the Niseis, they, they can't stand it when the priests chant the sutras in Sino-Japanese language for the oldsters. They want to hear, Buddha loves me, this I know, for the sutra tells me so. No, they want to look as much as they can, like Protestants, because that's exotic to them, you see? We're uh, writing our new myth, and uh, yes, um, but we all I, do we, we, we have to in our sessions relive the Christ thing, the Buddha thing, the we Christian do. thing. But right. we are creating a new we, myth, right? You are, uh, and we won't have saints. Uh, we, but we do. We do it in our own way. Everybody on his own discovers the immemorial truth which has been handed down, and that's the only way you can get it, because you can't follow the truth as other people have taught it. You can't imitate it. You can only discover it out of your own thing. And by doing your own stuff, you keep repeating the eternal pattern. And uh, this probably is the sort of situation we have. Well, you think because an egg was thrown at me at Santa Monica... Oh, that I'm, I'm not be... just talking of that egg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking of what was thrown at you in Laredo. Uh, that worries me not at all. No, well, that's as it should be. Somehow. In game activity, when I wander into the television studio and yeah. try to do things, uh, if I can bat 50%, 500%, yes. it's incredible. Uh, half things I've done are wrong, mistakes. I'm yeah. sorry I did them. Well, we the all moratorium on pot and LSD, you hear it was ridiculous. I shouldn't have done that. No, I mean, uh, well, we all make fools of ourselves yeah. occasionally. Uh, Good God. I make a uh, blunder. Uh, yeah. At least one out of two times I come to bat. Well, no. These celebrations uh, were a mistake. Uh, they st the first four were great. They were spontaneous religious outbursts. But then it became a success. And people said, yes, you've got to keep them going. You've got to take it around the country and so forth. That was a mistake. It was a mistake to make it commercial, a mistake to have it in the theater, a mistake to uh, sure. charge admission, a uh, mistake to keep a static form going. But we've dropped out of it. Well, what are you going to do with the celebration? It was beautiful, though. The first you... four uh, celebrations were... Uh, well, have, you any, of, have you uh, any way of finding a ritual for celebration, which, you know, or, or are you making use of the, of, the, of the established rituals or the historical knowledge that's been coming out lately on ritual to make a celebration, which is, or, or, which is you know, like really uh, communal and beautiful? Or, well, or do you want to do... In San Francisco was... Uh, I think that... The high point... Yes. Uh, and uh, every time I've talked uh, since that day, and I said, "Listen, we're dropping out of the of the theater celebrations. Goodbye, show business." Uh, Real. Right. Yeah. Robert Oppenheimer is reported to have said quite recently that obviously the world is going to hell, and the only way that it could be stopped was not to try to prevent it from happening. <laughs> That's pretty far now, out. Yeah, in other is. words, when there is a game the guy going that on, the atomic bomb. <laughs> when there is a game going on it? that's on a collision course and that this game obviously is going to lead to total destruction, the only way of getting people out of a bad game Isn't is <laughs> to, say, to indicate that the game is no longer interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. See, uh, we, we've left this game, and um, it, it, it bores us. And uh, we, we've got something going on over here, which is where it's at, <laughs> you know? That's the point. And this is it's just where it's at, and everybody who's playing this game, you know, the, we're in that plane going, yeah, on the mark, you know? And suddenly they realize that that's not where it's at. Something people are doing over on the other side. And they go, what's going on there? <laughs> Oh, no, really, let's I think, go out yeah. to the Haight Ashbury and see what's happening over there yeah. because maybe really? something's happening. In, instead of, <laughs> no, really, Tim, instead of the emphasis on the dropping out, I, I think in a sense it's it's more to the point to say there's something else going on. Right. Yeah. It didn't sound uh, alliteratively correct, though. 
Oh. Tune in, turn on this. <laughs> He's got a. Unless, unless his, his language is interpreted in a way which is understandable and acceptable. Well, that's a matter of finding, poetic to of finding a, uh, a, a euphonious formula. If it had been. It was just too late to say that. You know, turn on, drop out, tune in. But well, he really means drop out, he keeps saying, and then finally we would just bring the transistors back in all the time. People like Mario uh, Savio are offended by the word drop out because it offends a bodhisattva feeling of compassion. Yeah, you know, want to very express definitely. compassion. And because it's negative rather than positive and it's overtones as the last of the three. The last of three should be. Well, now look here, Tim, at that thing in Santa Monica. You made two points. One was A. You can't stay high all the time because when you finally come down from the high, you realize that the ordinary state of consciousness is one with the high state. This to me has been the most fantastic thing in all my LSD experiences, that the moment I come down yeah. is the critical moment of the whole experience. I suddenly realize that this everyday world around me is exactly the same thing mm -hmm. as the world of the right. beatific vision. Yeah. Right. Now, then, how do you integrate that realization with the dropout? All right, uh, we'll change the uh, slogan. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm completely with Mark McLuhan. Everything I say is just a probe. I'm trying to get people to... Uh, yes, I get that. Seattle. I do the same thing. Uh, I, uh, Seattle, you know, uh, we were banned from Seattle, and I went up there and talked about menopause and mentality and drop out, and, uh, and all the cocktail parties, and uh, what does it mean? Drop out? Menopausal? Menopausal mentality? What does it mean? Drop out? Uh, I would agree to change the slogan to drop out, turn on, drop in. You've been listening to Alan Watts, Gary Snyder, Alan Ginsberg, Tim Leary, and Alan Cohen in a discussion called Changes, the Houseboat Summit, recorded in 1967 on the ferryboat Vallejo, my father's home in Sausalito, California. This podcast was produced in conjunction with the Ramdas Be Here Now podcast network. Our theme music is by Zakir Hussein from The Rhythm Experience. And for further information on the recordings of Alan Watts, please visit alanwatts.org. Again, that's alanwatts.org. And thank you for listening today. <laughs>